Well, hello again, and uh, I'm still dealing with the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, this week, just out of interest, I'm into, uh, the, I think, it's the NIV uh, version. Normally, I prefer to stick to the authorised. Um, it's one I grew up with, but unfortunately, there's so many different versions. I prefer to stick to something which is a little bit more consistent. Anyway. Um, so we're into Acts chapter 12, and this is, to me, an extremely interesting chapter. I may have difficulty in dealing with it in the time, because it starts off and uh, following on from uh, Peter's experiences in chapter 11, which, of course, was that he must take the gospel to the Gentiles, not just this is the vision that he had of the unclean animals on the sheet. But now, um, because at the end of chapter 11, it says, during this time, some prophets came from Jerusalem, Antioch, um, and they're prophesying a famine in the Roman world, which actually did happen. And... Um, so then it comes back into Jerusalem. Uh, this is quite interesting as we get on as to where this was taking place because King Herod in verse 1 of chapter 12 was arresting some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. Well, <laughs> that's what was happening if you... <laughs> People don't like it to think that they're being persecuted now, and Christians are. I, I've been persecuted, but the fact is that that was the position in the early church. And it's not only persecution, but it says in verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword, so he killed him. And in verse 3, when he saw that this pleased the Jews. I mean, this is quite incredible because Herod is not just acting on his own initiative, and uh, later on we'll deal with who Herod is, but um, the fact is that he's uh, not only arresting uh, Christians uh, to persecute, He's now killed James, the father of John. And because the Jews liked that, he proceeded to arrest Peter and makes one wonder what would have happened to Peter. I mean, <laughs> as the story goes on, it doesn't deal with what uh, might have happened, but I have a strong suspicion that he would probably have killed Peter, particularly after what happened in the previous chapter. So, this happened during the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and after the matter of arresting him, uh, as we see in verse 4, he put him in prison, handed him over to the guards. And uh, this is where the... Um, the NIV gives a, a clear description of what happened. He was to be guarded by four squads, each containing four soldiers. That's 16. And I would assume they did it in rotation. And the purpose that Herod had was that he would, at the end of the Passover, Easter, uh, nowadays, that he would bring Peter out and put him on public trial. Now, let me just briefly say, this Herod is also the Herod that took part in the trial of Jesus himself, but more about that later, because there were two Herods, Herod the Great and Herod Antipas. So, in verse 5, Peter was kept in prison, and the church 
was earnestly praying to God for him. Uh, it doesn't tell us exactly what they were praying. Um, and, of course, this is very important to me because, as most of you will know, um, I myself was put in a communist prison for preaching the gospel in 1972, which is uh, more than 50 years ago, 52 years ago. And I was arrested for Bible smuggling, but also for preaching the gospel, and not the, the content of the Bible was in question. So I understand what's happening. He's in prison, going to be brought on trial. I was put on trial. Yes, of course I was. And um, while they couldn't prove most of the accusations against me, and significantly they couldn't even prove that I was smuggling, <laughs> but that you have to read the book to find out about that. I was finally condemned on the content of the Bible, which attacks the state. Anyway, verse 5, Peter's kept in prison, the church are praying. And as I'm saying, it doesn't say what they were praying. I would assume they were praying that Peter's life would be spared, that God would give him courage in the trial, which was going to come in a few days. But verse 6, the night before Herod was to bring him out of the prison and put him on trial, Peter, and I want you to look very carefully at this. It says in verse 6, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers and he was bound with two chains, I believe one on each hand or arm. And it says that sentry stood guard at the entrance. But more than that, because we also know that he was between two soldiers bound by chains. So he was held by the soldiers and also sentries at the entrance, that would possibly account for four, when the angel of the Lord appeared and the light shone in the cell. The angel struck Peter on his side, waking him up and saying, quick, get up. He did, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Because he's chained between two soldiers. He also has guards at the door. But when he gets up with the angel's command, the chains fell off. And it appears that the soldiers weren't aware that it was happening. This is, to me, having been in in prison and all things like this, I, I find this is fascinating. And so in verse 8, the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your shoes. Peter did. And then he wrapped her cloak around you and follow me. I would assume that in the prison he certainly didn't have many clothes on, nor did I. I know what it was like. And coming out he would, uh, because this is not particularly warm weather, he would want uh, to have a coat. And the angel said, follow me. And in verse 9, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing. He had no idea. At this point, he simply thought that he was dreaming, saw a vision. And it's quite interesting because I actually did have a very significant dream or vision when I was in prison because after I'd only been in for four months and just after my trial, I actually had a clear vision of the day that I would be released. And I saw myself out of the prison preaching in the largest auditorium in London. So I fully understand here Peter doesn't understand what's happening, can't realize that it's actually true, and what he's doing is he thinks it's simply a vision or a dream. 
But in verse 10, they passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. So they'd passed all the other guards, nobody at the moment seeing him. And the iron gate leading to the city opened by itself. And when they walked through it and walked the length of simply one street, the angel left him. And then suddenly, in verse 11, Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. So you you can understand, suddenly it's only when he's actually walking down the street that he realizes what had happened. So by the time you get to verse 12, when this dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, And it appears that um, it's John, whose brother James had been killed by Herod. And um, when he, there are a lot of people, it seems that most of the church were gathered in the house and were praying, having a powerful prayer meeting, praying for Peter. And Peter, I love this, I love this story. In verse 13, Peter knocked on the outer entrance, the door, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. (laughs) Yes, but she was so shocked. I wouldn't just use the word overjoyed here. I would say, yes, she was excited, but she was so shocked. She ran back without opening the door. (laughs) I I can just, here's Peter banging on the door. The girl's seen him, recognized who it is, and is so excited and shocked that she doesn't even open the door. It's almost as if she's seeing an apparition or a dream. And she goes back and uh, said, it's Peter. And in verse 15, The response of those in prayer, and again, I like this, response of these people in prayer is, you're out of your mind. You're dreaming. You're seeing things. How can Peter be at the door? We know he's in prison and we're praying for him to get out. (laughs) And when she kept insisting, verse 15, when, when she kept insisting that it was Peter, They said it must be his angel. (laughs) They still, you know, (laughs) it it shocks me that um, here are people praying specifically and when the answer is at the door, they can't even believe and accept it. You know, sometimes I think that's a danger with uh, people praying in in the church. Do they really expect to get their answer? I sometimes think with Christians, If God actually physically answered what they asked for, they would be so shocked because so often there is no real expectation that God can do it. And, you know, I find much of praying is not praying factually in faith for something to happen, but just wishy-washy, oh, I can't stand that sort of praying. If I'm praying, I'm very strong and determined I know what I want. Anyway. So the peop- the church praying inside is convinced Peter isn't there, it's only an angel. But in verse 16, Peter kept on knocking and banging and making so much noise, and when they opened the door and they saw him, they were astonished. You know, astonished because God had answered their prayer. And uh, Peter It says in verse 17, motion with his hand for them to be quiet. And then he described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he simply then said, um, uh, James, tell James and the brothers about this. And he left for another place. (laughs) He didn't stay long with them (laughs) because there, there, there was no faith here. He left. And in verse 18 in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers 
as to what had happened because when they woke up, I mean, they were asleep in the middle of the night when they woke up. They, in verse 19, Herod made a thorough search for him, couldn't find him, and he cross-examined the guards and had them put to death. So <laughs> the, the poor guards uh, are themselves executed because how did Peter get out? And they had no, they, they got no answer. They didn't know they were asleep. They didn't see what happened. And uh, yeah, <laughs> knowing my own release from prison, I understand the shock of what was happening. So it then says in verse 15, Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. And this, this is a little bit unusual here because it says in verse 20, he'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon and um, they sought an audience with him to try and resolve the problem. And having secured the support of uh, uh, someone who's a personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for the food supply. So when you come to verse 21, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his clothes, royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. And in verse 20, they shouted, this is the voice of a god, not a man. 23, immediately, because Herod didn't give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. He was eaten by warm worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. Now, you have to understand this, Herod. You see, I th a lot of people get very confused in the New Testament because there were two Herods. You see, this is not the Herod who ordered the killing of the babies when Jesus was born. That was Herod the Great. This is his son, Herod Antipas. And there are several significant things. The first is that Herod the Great, who was actually about 74 years old when Jesus was born, he was born, the historians say, the year 73 BC, before Christ. So he would have been about 74 when Jesus was born, and he ordered the killing of the babies. But Herod the Great was known because of his, the buildings that he put up. He was known uh, and, and was called Herod the Great because he was famous for building things. And it was Herod the Great that built, rebuilt the temple, which took, I think, about 30 years to, to rebuild. And it's very significant to me that Herod the Great who ordered the building of the temple, and it was completed at the time of Christ. To me, I'm seeing a significance here that the temple, which had always been associated with God's presence because of the Ark of the Covenant and so on, that the temple had to be rebuilt for the first time Jesus appears, okay? It was destroyed, as you know, in AD 70. That was uh, 35, 40 years after Jesus died. But the significant thing is Scripture says the temple has to be rebuilt for the second coming of Christ. You know, I've never seen this before. It's only when I was really researching into this, I realized the significance there has to be some strong significance in the fact that the temple, right from the beginning, back to David's time, Solomon's time, was built to the glory of God and to reflect the greatness of God. And I've often spoken on uh, the amount of gold that David, 144 tons of gold. In other words, that first temple was a, a, a phenomenal building. And that, 
of course, was destroyed. And then finally, it was to be rebuilt. Well, it was, re it was restored in the time of Jeremiah. It was restored. But now it's, it's Herod that really rebuilds the temple. And in fact, the temple at the time of Jesus was known as Herod's temple. So it was very significant. And it is very significant that the temple has to be rebuilt for the Antichrist to sit in. Scripture is clear that the Antichrist sits in the temple proclaiming that he is God. So now who is this Herod that has now died by an act of God? And uh, this is very significant because um, he was blaspheming and God struck him down. Now, who is this? This is Herod Antipas. Now, he, there's several things about him. One, he was the Herod that was present at the trial of Jesus. And the trial of Jesus was between Herod and Pilate. And why did Pilate send him to Herod? Why was Herod a king? He's called King Herod. He was actually a king of a Jewish area. He was king over the region of Galilee. And the reason that, uh, that Pilate sent Jesus to this Herod was because Jesus was a Galilean. Scripture says this. It's, it's, it's there in the Bible. Because Jesus was from Galilee, Nazareth in Galilee, so he handed him over to the Jewish king. And when you realize that Jesus is handed to a Jewish king for trial, you understand the accusation against him was that he was king of the Jews. Now, I see a strong connection between Herod being king of the Jews, the Galileans, and Jesus accused of being the greater king of the Jews. That's what was written across his cross. And so this is Herod Antipas, and he was part with the trial. Now, I find the significance because this Herod now that we're reading about in Acts 12 is the one who's now persecuting the church. Can you see? I mean, I've just, just, just been reading that in the previous verses, that um, this, this Herod, he's persecuting the church, he's killed James, the brother of John, and he's put Peter in prison. The same Herod who was guilty of being there only a short time before, only a short time before, when... Jesus was crucified. Is this God's judgment? Is that why when he makes himself to be a God and not a man? You know, I, I find the significance here that this is the Herod that was accusing of Jesus because they accused of being king of the Jews. And here... Herod, who has a title, king of the Jews, is making himself to be a god. And an angel of the Lord struck him down. He was eaten by worms and died. But verse 24 is important because it says the word of God continued to increase and spread. So the persecution didn't stop the church. In fact, the church grew more through persecution. And I think sometimes today that what the church needs in this country and in many countries is a taste of persecution to strengthen and consolidate the faith. You see, I worked with the underground church for 30-odd years and saw the persecution and saw... It was seeing their faith in the underground church under persecution that led me 
to do what I did. It's a challenge. Yes, and so the word of God grew. And verse 25, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem. So now it goes back to Barnabas and Saul, not Peter. The, uh, Peter has done the major part of his job, as you'll see. And so we then see Barnabas and Saul, who then take on the ministry. And we're going to continue this. It, to me, it's very illuminating. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot myself as I study this. God bless you. My God will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise. When you are committed to and support the gospel, then stand on this promise that when you give to the extension of the kingdom, God will supply all your need. Jesus called it giving and receiving. This year God has given us wonderful opportunities to preach the gospel in Armenia, Georgia and Poland. And we continue to support Ukraine by distributing humanitarian and spiritual aid. For 12 months, our staff have helped the displaced, vulnerable and injured, supplying food and medicines. To make a donation, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash donation. Strength for now and for eternity. David will guide you through the Apostle Paul's letters to the Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. David has written this book to strengthen your faith at a time when everything around us is being shaken. Join David as he delves deep into the truths of the Bible. Order David's book, A Firm Foundation, by visiting our website, eurovision.org.uk forward slash shop. We would like to give you a free gift. David Hathaway's Prophetic Vision magazine is available free of charge. All you need to do is ask for it. This faith-building resource will show you the path to revival in your life and ministry. To receive this free magazine, visit eurovision.org.uk forward slash magazine.